Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. And today we're going to talk about democracy. Real quick, though, I want to mention our upcoming supporter summit in Hilton Head, South Carolina, from October 10th through the 12th. Uh, this is our annual event, specifically for supporters, where you'll have a chance to meet many of our senior fellows and top scholars. Uh, to reserve your spot for that, visit uh, Mises.org, that is M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G, and click on Events. Now to the topic. Uh, democracy is one of those topics where people spend a lot of time fighting over definitions. I know from experience that any time I might refer to democracy, in an American context, I often get many emails from listeners and readers telling me that the United States is not a democracy, but a republic. Okay, but saying that isn't actually very helpful unless you define your terms. Uh, in practice, of course, the term democratic can mean anything from small-scale direct democracy to the mega elections we see in today's uh, very large countries. You'll find many American conservatives rely on James Madison when they make the claim that democracy is a bad thing and republics are better and that the United States is a republic and anything that people label democratic must be bad. Uh, well, if you actually read Madison's definition of democracy, Madison uses the word pretty much only to describe small states with direct democracy. That is, a small Swiss town in Madison's day where the population voted directly on policies and, and would meet uh, in a, a people's assembly. And also a lot of his critique of democracy is based on that idea of democracy. Obviously, that definition of democracy describes no country in the world today. So if we're going to rely on Madison as the arbiter of democracy being bad, well, then we clearly have nothing to worry about because there aren't any of them in the world. And really, no, it doesn't look like any are going to form anytime soon. In fact, pretty much every country on Earth today uh, that are generally referred to as democracies under Madison's definition are republics. For Madison, a republic is pretty much any place that used representative government uh, of the sort we now find so widespread in most of the world's countries, right? All these countries have national legislatures. It's not direct democracy. They elect people in elections to vote on the laws. That, that's anything with like that is a republic according to Madison's definition. So uh, democracy is not really something in Madison's view that uh, is a big deal in the world today. It's pretty much absent. Uh, but that's, of course, not how when people write me to say America's a republic, not a democracy. They're, they're either deliberately ignoring that terminology or not using it, uh, but they shouldn't be using Madison as an explanation of what a republic is. But then, of course, there's other problems with the word democracy. It's, it's often used as a propaganda term. Among the modern social democratic left, the term just means something I like, right? We see this all the time when, oh, you need to vote for Biden or Harris in order to, quote unquote, save democracy. Of course, there's never a definition given of what democracy is in that case or how you would know that democracy is gone exactly. Uh, let's just say the odds of there not being any more elections of some sort is pretty small. So by that definition, if you have elections, you have elected representatives for laws, there's a democracy there. So unless that gets abolished, I don't think there's any danger of abolishing democracy unless you're defining it some other specific way. But that the way it's used as a propaganda term always reminds me of the way uh, the, the revolutionary communists always used the term revolutionary. And you would see this all the time where uh, in very much the same way that the modern left uses the term democratic, that is, here's a good thing, so it must be democratic. And that other side, they do stuff I don't like, so they're anti-democratic or destroying democracy. The old communists used the word revolutionary in, in a sense of not having necessarily anything at all to do with a revolution and not necessarily having anything to do with a revolutionary ideology, just that if you were supporting the regime, you were doing something that the regime liked, it was revolutionary, which, was meant, which meant good. And, oh, look, we're doing this revolutionary thing. This thing fits the revolution. And uh, Cuba used this all the time under Castro. 
Uh, and conversely, then, to do anything that wasn't pro-regime or to be a threat to the ruling communist regime was to engage in anti-revolutionary activities or counter-revolutionary activities. So the bad guys were always counter-revolutionaries and the good guys were always revolutionaries in this way, in the way this worked. And of course, the terms had no bearing whatsoever to reality of was this, did this have something to do with the revolution? In fact, most of the stuff that was described as revolutionary by the regime was actually in support of the status quo. So really quite the opposite of revolutionary. And often another term was also used was uh, bourgeois, these bourgeois anti-revolutionary activities. So it was just a, it was just a boogeyman used by the communist left to uh, describe anything that didn't support the regime was counter-revolutionary, bourgeois, anti-revolutionary, that sort of thing. And we see that today in the way that democracy is used as a propaganda term by the left. But if you see, if you spend time reading about political history beyond just repeating phrases from the Federalist Papers or something like that, you just generally find that the meaning of the term can vary significantly from time to time and from place to place. Uh, during the Jacksonian period, for example, the Democratic Party, which was the good party at the time, it was the laissez-faire, decentralist, free market party, uh, they used the word democratic all the time. They also spoke about, when speaking of the United States, they also referred to the republic, or often they used the word confederation or confederacy, actually, to refer to the United States. Uh, this was before the Civil War, of course. Used the, but they, they called the party, quote-unquote, the democracy so there, there wasn't any problem with using the term among people who wanted very limited government. Uh, and then, of course, by the 20th century, the way the word, the word was used was, was quite different. Uh, the way the FDR people used it was very different. It had very little bearing then to the idea of democracy from the early 19th century at that point. Uh, and then, of course, in Europe, right, democracy meant all sorts of different terms, depending on the different types of regime you had. So you really have to look at the context of how the term is being used, and you need to provide some sort of definition. Uh, but to, to really get a better idea of what we might mean by the term, what, if we are going to use the term democracy, is there any sort of democracy that works? We all know that there's big problems with majoritarian rule, right? This is consistently a problem, especially with anybody who's not on the winning side. They see that, okay, if I'm 49% of the population, the people I like are 49% of the population, well, we're going to consistently lose to the side that has 51% of uh, a certain group on their side. Or the way that is often phrased in political science classes such as, all you need to rule over the losing side in a majority, majority rule system is 50% plus one. You don't even need 51%, right? You just need 50% of the voters plus one, or even just 50% of the votes as counted plus one. It doesn't even have to be 50% plus one of the voters, of course, because uh, there can be cheating. And uh, that strikes many people as a bad way of doing things, because then what it means is 50% minus one of the population essentially is just powerless. Uh, and I think we can, if we want to understand then, okay, what is what is democracy in any sort of meaningful way or how has the term been used in ways that are actually useful or where can democracy be a good thing in terms of looking at these texts that look at uh, political regime types and the, the ideal type of polity. I think, we, I think we find the way it's used by Ludwig von Mises uh, to be pretty good. And he offers a unique vision on what democracy means and, and how uh, you deal with the problem of majority rule. And I wanted to look at this here. Uh, often Mises, Mises, of course, and among many of our listeners and people who are, of course, familiar with our organization, the Mises Institute, they know a few things about Mises. And they also know that he often speaks well of, quote unquote, democracy. But what does he mean by that? Uh, if we do read delve into his views, we see clearly he was not in favor of majority rule. So what could he possibly mean by democracy? He had a pretty sophisticated view of politics. Uh, of course, he grew up in Austria-Hungary in, in the Austrian Empire in the late 19th and early 20th century, very well, of, very well aware of a variety of different political controversies, the problem of majority rule in a multi-ethnic society, all that sort of stuff. 
Uh, and he noted that majority rule was very dangerous in diverse societies like Austria-Hungary, where had all sorts of different linguistic groups, ethnic groups, groups with different interests. And so how to deal with any of that? How did he end up using the word democracy to describe that? Uh, so let's let's look at that a little bit, and I think we can get some insight into the only way that you can make a a system work where the voting public has a significant amount of power, and where fifty fifty percent plus one of the voter of the voting population or of the votes basically gets to rule over the other forty or fifty percent minus one. How do you deal with that? Uh, so. Mises looks at this, and he has uh, certainly a critique of democracy that uh, is insightful and helps us see the problems here. He, he notes, given his experiences in Austria-Hungary, uh, that uh, democracy is a problem when it allows uh, one group to be in a permanent minority status. So... Uh, he says here that if if you're a member of this minority nation, so say you're in a in a society that is uh, fifty percent plus one German speaking, and then fifty percent fifty percent minus one Hungarian speaking. This would be an example he would use, being from where he was from. Uh, he he sees that quote uh, this minority group that is the fifty percent minus one group quote, according to the letter of the law, could be a citizen with full rights. But in truth, he is politically without rights, a second-class citizen, a pariah. So you can see how this works, right? Say, let's just use an, an American example. Let's say that 50% plus one of the population had values along the lines of the modern Democratic Party, or people who call themselves progressives. But that you had this very large major minority, say 50% minus one of people, who consider themselves Trump supporters, and they didn't get along with progressives at all. Well, if those progressives keep winning elections time after time after time, as may very well be the case from now on, what you're going to end up with is a large permanent minority group. And so, of course, these groups then are going to, according to the letter of the law, have full rights. But in reality, their minority voice is essentially meaningless because they can never exercise any sort of real uh, ownership over the regime and never really push through any of their own policies. So they're a permanent minority group that has no political power. They're just out of power permanently. Mises thought there was a problem with that. He also didn't see how a system like that could possibly preserve private property rights because now you have, you're in a position where the majority group can endlessly exploit the minority group. And we see similar ideas like this expressed throughout Mises' work, including his work on immigration. Uh, now, Mises, uh, he recognized that there was no economic argument against immigration because he was fully in favor of free movement of goods. And he also recognized that in terms of the best use of labor and the division of labor and really having um, maximizing wealth in your society, that there should be free movement of labor and free movement of persons so they can go wherever the, the, the best capital is and that, that, that labor can best be used. But Mises was certainly no naive person. He understood that there were political problems uh, that can arise through the three free movement of labor. And he talks about that in a lot of his works. Uh, he mentions on the issue of immigration that anywhere you have a situation where you have a large ethnic group come in and maybe even become the majority, that this would essentially erase the rights of the minority ethnic native-born group and that, of course, would lead to significant political uh, disruption, uh, possibly even war or civil war and serious problems. So he recognized uh, political issues not directly related to the economic benefits of the free movement of labor. And so in his view of majority rule and democracy, he's also trying to address these issues of migration. And what if different people of different ethnic groups move around and change that balance then and create new national minorities within a, a larger uh, majority group. And so clearly he was no majoritarian because he recognized the political instability that can result from changes in majority groups, that, uh, that is very hard to protect private property when you have a permanent minor majority that leads over a permanent minority. 
that is essentially where people are reduced to uh, second-class citizens and cannot exercise political rights. Uh, so what can he mean by democracy then after he, he's finished, as you'll find in his works, uh, trashing the idea of majority rule and essentially sowing the seeds in many cases for civil war, or just the, the rank destruction of political rights? Uh, he talks about uh, democracy and what it means in two of his most important political works. Mises wrote primarily on economics, especially in his later decades. And I'll often receive emails from people saying, well, Mises barely wrote anything on politics, so we just don't even know what his political views is. And they'll often quote stuff from his much later works like Human Action, which came in the 40s. And they'll say, oh, I don't, I don't see much politics here. But of course, when we look at uh, early Mises, who was trying to address all of these very, very important issues after the end of the First World War, he has a lot of, a lot of views about politics and what regimes should be like and how democracy should happen. So let's look at some of those. And, and I think we find these uh, in two books, especially. Uh, one is his 1919 book called Nation, State, and Economy. And the other is his 1927 book, Liberalism, by which, of course, he means classical liberalism, the free market ideology we associate today with, say, Thomas Jefferson or John Locke. So in both of those books, he lays out details of how to limit the power of government regimes, preserve freedom. Uh, so it's here where we start to get a sense of what he means by democracy. And he uses it quite different from how people use it today, where they just mean majority rule. And then if you're in the majority, you get to forcibly impose your views and whatever laws you pass on everybody else. Uh, and that is essentially, that would, of course, jibe with what we know today about how people think monopolistic states should function, right? The, hey, you're in charge, the will of the majority, and you get to impose this monopolistic power on everybody because you don't just get to break off pieces of a country into your own independent country. Uh, modern Americans seem to have a big problem with the secession idea. Mises, writing back in Austria at the time, had no problem with it, and we see here in how he talks about democracy. So Mises' vision of democracy must be understood in light of his support for unlimited secession as a tool against majoritarian rule. For Mises, democracy means the free exercise of a right of exit by which the alleged will of the majority, quote-unquote, is rendered unenforceable. Because, yeah, you might have then a majority ethnic group, language group, religious group, whatever, imposing its will then on a minority group within that same country. However, the escape clause for Mises here, the way you exercise real democracy, is then you can leave, you can, you can break off a piece of the country where your so that your minority ethnic group becomes the majority and this is this is absolutely core to mises's view of what democracy is and how it can be used to actually protect rights rather than destroy them so uh we, we, we can only understand mises's idea of democracy if we note his conception of a liberal state also is not really a state at all that is it doesn't meet the common definition of a state that we get from Max Weber, right? This is Weber's term is mostly what we use nowadays in political science to describe was what a state is. A state is an organization that has a monopoly on the means of coercion within a given territory. This common definition now used. And uh, Mises used the term as well. He knew he knew about Weber and actually quoted Weber. And but for Mises' view of democracy. This this isn't a uh, this isn't a state at all in that there is no real monopoly power because there's always this right of exit. And how does this work out for Mises then? Well, first of all, let's look at his definition of democracy. He says he provides a definition in Nation State and Economy. He says democracy is self determination, self government, self rule. So. All right, unquote. This prompts us then to ask what he means by terms like self-determination. Well, uh, he, he, he tells us what that means, too. He says, for Mises, uh, self-determination is this. He puts this out in his, uh, he writes this in his 1927 book, Liberalism. The right of self-determination in regard to the question of membership in a state thus means whenever the inhabitants of a particular territory, whether it be a single village, a whole district, or a series of adjacent districts makes it known by a freely conducted plebiscite 
that they no longer wish to remain united to the state in which they belong at the time. Their wishes are to be respected and complied with. And then he even goes on to say, if it were in any way possible to grant this right of self-determination to every individual person, it would have to be done, unquote. So Mises is embracing a very radical view of secession here, and he's tying it very closely to his idea of self-determination. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I uh, posted here in Radio Rothbard a speech I made on the, the relationship, relationship between self-determination and secession. You can go back and look at that if you want more details on the, the general historical trend there and how that works today. Uh, but Mises, of course, was very much involved in that as a classical liberal, uh, and he used it in his own thinking and his own political vision. Now, so in, in Mises' view, groups of people who are able to express the right of self-determination will then tend to voluntarily group themselves into polities, Mises calls free national states, and we'll talk about his vision about the nation in a few minutes. Uh, Mises' national state is not a monopolistic state, uh, and he explicitly says this. He says, quote, no people and no part of a people shall be held against its will in a political association that it does not want, unquote. So clearly, if, if your democracy means self-determination in the way that Mises says it does, you're in a very uh, vibrant and constantly changing sort of political group where once you have established a permanent majority over a permanent minority ethnic group, then that, that minority group's going to want to leave, and Mises thinks they should have the right to leave. Mises also knows that this is really very important in avoiding things like civil wars and revolutions and bloody upheavals, because you need to give people that out of exit. Now, Mises contrasts this type of free association with the quote-unquote princely state, and this is essentially the modern state as we come to know it. The princely state, Mises writes, quote, strives restlessly for expansion of its territory and for increase in the numbers of its subjects. The more land and the more subjects, the more revenues and the more soldiers, unquote. So this is, this is the vision of the state where majority rule is especially dangerous because you've established these frontiers, these borders, and everyone inside them is now subject to whatever the state wants to do and there's no escape. And so once you have a functioning majority coalition of whatever sort, they can then rule with impunity the minority group. And the only way then to escape that, since you have no chance of uh, getting a majority vote, is through some sort of violent means of leaving, unless, of course, you are allowed self-determination in the way Mises talks about it. And, of course, Mises has a long discussion elsewhere about uh, in a truly liberal world, borders don't even matter because everyone has a free movement of goods. And so there wouldn't even be a reason then to migrate because there would be free movement of capital as well in those cases. Uh, and uh, that's, that's, that's a different part of Mises that you, that you could go into. Um, but he recognized that in the real world, there are borders and that not every state is a liberal state, and certainly there isn't total free trade. So he's trying to address this issue of, okay, so how do we deal with these, uh, this lack of equality between different majority minority groups? The answer, he says, is secession. It's this ability to exit and found your own state. And he says this specifically, in lib quote, liberalism knows no conquests, no annexations. The problem of the size of the state is unimportant to it, it forces no one against his will into the structure of the state. Whoever wants to emigrate is not held back. When a part of the people of a state wants to drop out of the union, liberalism does not hinder it from doing so. Colonies that want to become independent need only do so." Unquote. So, uh, of course, Mises didn't, he didn't hold uh, this vision just for uh, Europeans, he also recognized the importance of allowing the same sort of self-determination to people outside of the core country. He recognized the damage that colonies did. He, uh, he wanted to extend self-determination to people in Africa and Asia, those people who were subject to the same sort of majority rule, where, of course, the, com the members of the colonies usually didn't have votes at all, so were, of course, essentially, were definitely second secondhand citizens within the polities that they were in. Uh, now, Mises concludes that democracy means thus means groups of people, including very small groups of people, can freely choose to remain in the state or leave. And so that's what he means by democracy. Uh, this is obviously very different from how it's mostly used nowadays. 
Uh, now, he does say that, okay, you're bound to submit your... Once you decide to not act and not separate yourself from a particular polity, you are bound to submit yourself to the laws favored by that territory's uh, ruling majority coalition, which hopefully you are a part of. Uh, now, you have the option to exit, but of course, Mises recognized that a functioning society actually has to have laws and uh, some sort of uh, ability to enforce those laws within its own territory. However, he knows that that whole system and the state's legitimacy breaks down once you have uh, these, these permanent minority groups within those polities. Now, without this right of self-determination, um, every state is in practice a monopolistic state thus and can impose its laws and agenda on the entire population. Uh, so democracy of that sort is unacceptable. I wrote up an article saying a lot of this last week in an article titled, uh, What Mises Meant by Democracy. And an observant reader emailed me to note that Hans Hermann Hoppe, in his book, Democracy, The God That Failed, that Hoppe says some very similar things. Uh, specifically, he writes, as Mises rejected a princely state as incompatible with the protection of private property rights, what was to be substituted for it? His answer was democracy and democratic government. However, Mises' definition of democratic government is fundamentally different from its colloquial meaning. Mises grew up in a multinational state and was painfully aware of the anti-liberal results of majority rule in ethnically mixed territories. Rather than majority rule, to Mises, democracy meant literally self-determination, self-government, self-rule. And accordingly, a democratic government was an essentially voluntary membership organization in that it recognized each of its constituents' unrestricted right to secession. Hence, Mises' answer as to how to assure that a government will protect proper, private property rights is through the threat of unlimited secession and its own characteristic of voluntary membership, unquote. Uh, well, here we see uh, just coming at it from a, a different angle, as Hoppe does in his book on democracy, we find essentially the same thing about what Mises is saying about democracy, that it is essentially based on voluntary membership within some sort of political union, political confederation, political group, uh, but that there is always the option of exit. Now, this provides a check on power for Mises. And this idea is very old. Um, the idea that if there's the option of leaving some sort of polity at any time that this provides a limit on state power and a motivation for the state to not abuse its power, at least not as much as it would in a monopolistic state. Uh, I think one of the best discussions on this uh, from a broad historical international context is an essay by Ralph Rako called The European Miracle. Uh, in this essay, Rako looks at how the relative ease of exit in Europe over much of its history helped protect private property rights. That is, Rako looks at how there was never any single monopolistic state through the first, uh, almost all of, of Europe's history, and, and really is even true today, even with the EU in place, it has not quite yet achieved this, of of maintaining one monopoly over the continent. So what she ended up with was a, a single culture, essentially, which subscribed to broadly very similar religious views, even had a common language in the Middle Ages with Latin and such, that it was, there, it was fairly easy in that situation to exit. That is, you could, uh, you could leave one small polity and go to another, that polities were, were breaking off, uh, and, f and f joining up with other polities due to changes in uh, the ruling regime. And just that due to the just general practical lack of monopoly in this situation, lack of political monopoly, that you had a lot of practical exit, that is exit for uh, in, in practice. And this ended up creating a situation where private property rights were the most protected that they had been in pretty much any other society uh, in history. That is, Europe had more respect, really not out of just an ideological uh, view, but really just out of more of the practical realities of, of widespread exit and the, the ability to uh, escape 
the overbearing interventions of regimes in that situation. Contrast that with, say, China, where there was one large empire, or the caliphate of the Islamic world, or in Russia, which Reiko does not consider to be part of Europe, where he had a very large state, and uh, it was very difficult to escape that state. In, in Europe, especially Western Europe, that was not the case, Reiko notes. And it's, we find here this idea that exit, the, the ability to leave one state and join another, restrains private property rights. So Mises builds on that idea too, uh, and certainly was familiar with uh, some of the historical precedents here and, and some of the reasoning behind it. Now, there's another element here that's important to understand how all this plays out for Mises in real life. Uh, this is the issue of nationality. Joseph Salerno has done a lot of good work on this and talks about this issue uh, in a variety of different articles, one of which is a 2017 article called Mises on Nationalism, the Right of Self-Determination and the Problem of Immigration. Uh, Salerno basically recognizes that uh, for Mises, populations are going to divide themselves up into a variety of different national groups that share common values and that this is going to limit the amount of secession and self-determination that actually goes on out there. It's a dangerous world out there, and people are generally content with being governed within a group so long as the members of that group share their values. So as Salerno shows for Mises, people would voluntarily submit to governance from others within their quote-unquote national group. But this group could mean any number of things, such as a linguistic group, a religious group, etc. So long as people felt the majority within that group mostly reflected their views. Mises also thought that within this group there would be a degree of unity. Uh, Mises has written on how he imagines a large number of these so-called nations living side by side. Uh, he says, quote, The nationality principle includes only the rejection of every overlordship, it demands self-determination, autonomy. Then, however, its content expands. Not only freedom, but also unity is the watchword. But the desire for national unity, too, is above all thoroughly peaceful. Nationalism does not clash with cosmopolitanism, for the unified nation does not want discord with neighboring peoples, but peace and friendship." Unquote. Mises felt these groups were natural. And he said that this national group is distinct from a state or a polity. And he says that the national group is, quote, an organic entity, which can be neither increased nor reduced by changes in states, unquote. He also says, quote, those of his fellow men with whom he shares a common land and language and with whom he often forms an ethnic and spiritual community as well, unquote, is basically one's nation. That is, that is what one will see as one's natural group, his national group. Mises did not see any conflict with the ideals of free market liberalism here so long as the option of exit, that is self-determination, remained. Salerno summarizes it this way, quote, the nationality principle therefore implies that liberal nation states may comprise a monoglot people inhabiting geographically non-contiguous regions, provinces, and even villages. Mises contends that nationalism is thus a natural outcome of and incomplete harmony with individual rights. Here, here Salerno quotes Mises, quote, the formation of liberal democratic states comprising all of the members of a national group was the result of the exercise of the right of self-determination, not its purpose, unquote. Salerno continues, for Mises, the nation comprises humans who perceive and act toward one another in a way that separates them from other groups of people based on the meaning and significance the compatriots attach to objective factors such as shared language, traditions, ancestry, and so on. Membership in a nation, no less than in a family, involves concrete acts of volition based on subjective perceptions and preferences with respect to a complex of objective historical circumstances." Unquote. Put another way, once individuals make the decision to voluntarily be part of both a particular nation and a particular state, only then is the individual expected to obey coercive laws set down by civil governments, the sorts of laws required to maintain public order and private property. So when we combine the nationality principle with Mises' vision for secession and self-determination, we get a picture of what Mises imagined as the quote-unquote free national state. 
It was not a true state because it was voluntary, thanks to the option of exit. This free national state was also not merely a collection of individuals, all seeking to go their own way. And I think that in all of this, we can find a workable and reasonable view of how democracy is actually used to create a truly free, voluntary, and workable polity uh, in the world. Thank you for listening to this episode of Radio Rothbard. We'll be back next time with more, and we'll see you then.